Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am very glad to be joined by Mr. Tommy Piorek, who is a professional drummer and, most importantly, a Buddy Rich historian. Tommy, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Bart. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, we've made it happen, my friend, because this <laughs> one, I, I've i looked back, and um, I usually say this on the show when, when they've taken a little while to schedule, because it happens all the time, but you go back to me originally emailing you uh, in April of 2018 is when oh, we, we... Oh, my. <laughs> are you kidding we, me? We started, because that is literally uh, very, very close to right when I started um, the podcast in general. And the reason I found you is because Jim Messina, um, who everyone knows, I hope, because he's been on the show and it's just a kind of a, a well-known figure in the vintage community who has vintage drums talk, um, did a great video with you at the, at the Chicago show with your awesome buddy, rich snare drum collection. So that's, that's how I discovered you. So shout out to Jim and, um, that really kicked it off and and I have to I just have to say I am shocked it was 2018 I'm embarrassed by that I apologize oh, that's but all right I'm in high demand I, I just got to tell you <laughs> you're a busy know, man yeah, yeah. hardly it, it's it's just the, the way it goes so I'm, I'm glad we finally get together you know? absolutely and you're here now and that's all that matters and um so as I said before Tommy is a buddy rich historian and really really knows his stuff um and and we could talk about a million different buddy things, but um, this is a very uh, pretty specific thing that we're going to talk about, which is buddies snare drums from, you know, you, we, you kind of have a specific, uh, some specific dates that we're covering. So why don't you just give us a little description of, of what we're talking about, and then we can, we can jump right in and uh, start with the first of our, I believe, 15 snare drums. Yeah. Which we'll, we'll try and certainly get through. Yeah. Um, that is absolutely true. Uh, Buddy was a snare drum hound. I mean, everybody knows it. Everything emanated from the snare drum for him. And um, I discovered there was a period where he went absolutely bonkers with the snare drums. I mean, it's incredible. And uh, when I decided to try and research and put this actual collection together, uh, that is where I focused because the guy was changing snare drums sometimes twice a year. Uh, wow. That being said, yeah, uh, my collection ranges from 1949, 1950, and I decided to end uh, in 82. Uh, and, and I'll just pop this in here. After 82, he no longer had an endorsement. Nobody was interested, and there were many reasons for that. But he got that restored set of, uh, you know, Slingerland Radio Kings from Joe McSweeney, and he only ended up using one snare drum, possibly two, from 1982 till when he passed um, in 87. So anyway, that's why my collection focuses from 50 to 82. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and I, I should clarify, I said it before a little bit, but just to kind of like, you know, make it more obvious, you have, you know, owned and 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 showcased these snare drums. And the video I described with Jim Messina was really a, um, a you would have like a booth and you would, you know, this is all pre-COVID obviously then, but you would have yeah. a booth and you would showcase each, uh, not the, the buddy owned snare drum because that would be a, you know, unbelievable amount of money for all those, but the identical snare drum, correct, of each era. And, and, it, and it gets better than that even, which, which I'll tell you. This is what made this collection, I think, so focused. Not only were each of these snare drums the drum he was playing at exactly that period in his career, that wasn't good enough for me. I had to make sure I found a drum. The drum itself was correct. Yeah. In other words, date of manufacture and when he played it to that era. That was super, super difficult. And that's what really, really made this collection uh, so special. Yeah, for and sure. That's what's important, though, is, is that that's why, again, like I said, you're you're definitely a, a buddy rich um, expert. So, all right, let's jump in here and 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 uh, mention the date that we're starting again. And let's maybe just kind of start going down the line here and and and, uh, and knocking off these um, these snare yeah. drums as we go. So what's our first buddy rich snare drum? I just want to say this, too. Here's what we'll do. I think this might work really well. Uh, certain drums in this collection, Buddy was absolutely knocked out with. He was nuts for. Uh, I might focus a little more on those. The sure. others were 
he was just like blowing through them, looking for that magic snare, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So it, it won't be that bad. Cool. Th- that being said, the first drum in the collection uh, was a 1949-1950 WFL 3 by 13 Bebop, which uh, Ludwig named the Buddy Rich Bebop. That is so out of character for Buddy. I mean, uh, think about that. 3 by 13 Teen. Yeah, what it's a, a small, it's odd very size. small. Drum. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, the reason for that, he had gotten away from playing big band material around this time. He thought he might be wanting to get into bebop and what have you. That's why that drum came to be. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and and he played it, but not that long at all, uh, for the very simple reason. <laughs> around 1955, so maybe slightly earlier. He was right back into big band because that's his love. Yeah, for sure. So that, yeah. That being said, I have a picture in my personal collection of Buddy in the studio in 1950, uh, 1950, doing a recording with that three by 13. I don't think that picture has really been seen all that often. Sometimes I'm very hesitant to just throw stuff up on the internet. But anyway, there it was. He's actually playing it. Um, and uh, that's that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we all know though, but like at that point in time, Buddy Rich is obviously very famous. He's one of the, you know, biggest drummers in the world, if not the biggest drummer in the world. So he can get any gear he wants, right? I mean, that's fair to say. So true. But oh my God, see, there's a whole nother uh, can that we could open as far as endorsements. That's a whole nother discussion. Uh, But no, you're absolutely right. You you are indeed. Was he endorsed by WFL or was this a just a, I like this drum, I'm going to, you know, no. try it out? You know, it's been said many times. Buddy has said it in so many interviews, live and otherwise. I don't give a crap what the drums are. They're drums. I play them. Well, he's not being factual. He did yeah. care. Yeah. But that being said, no, he didn't care what company came knocking as long as he got his equipment. Sure. And uh, sure. by the way, he started with Slingerland in 1919 and went to Ludwig, uh, I think, during the 20s. Don't quote me on that because that one I don't have in my memory. Uh, yeah. But he stayed with WFL for quite some time. Hmm. So now we move to 1955. Uh, Buddy is back with his big band and the 3 by 13 Bebop ain't cutting it. So, William F. Ludwig, the original, the old man, uh, designs the 5.5 by 14 Buddy Rich Super Classic. And that's the snare drum he used for pretty much the rest of his Ludwig endorsement. And uh, there are a ton of those out there. I mean, a ton. Uh, they, they sold like proverbial hotcakes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So he's playing his, his signature snare drum, right? He is indeed. As a matter of fact, you just raised uh, a, a good point without even knowing it. Uh, Buddy Rich rarely, if ever, played custom-built snare drums. Uh, they were hmm. off the rack. Whatever he was playing when you went out to see him in a club, you could buy. Wow. That's pretty cool that it's 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 the real – because that happens sometimes where you see a – whatever, ex-drummer playing this, the, you know, their, their signature snare drum comes out and it's, it's $300 and they're playing a $3,000 yes. snare or something where it's not exactly the right, it's the watered down version that you get. But, but I guess Buddy's just, he's like, you know, I'll play it. Give it to me. Exactly. <laughs> off the rack. And you were exactly right about that, you know, spot on. Uh, the cool thing about the super classic, and then we'll move on um, to be a Buddy Rich, and this is a big problem with a lot of collectors uh, that I try to help, has to have the right throw off and the right butt. That sure. snare drum came two different ways. Also, one other really important thing Buddy never played nickel hardware. He just didn't. So, hmm. even in 55, to be a BR Super Classic, you really want that to be chrome. Gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. So anyway, Buddy ended up leaving WFL Ludwig in 1959, and he hooked on with Rogers in 1960, Hmm. which is uh, really neat because so many people that I've chatted with over over the decades 
and, and I am one of these guys, think that Rodgers was the best fit for him as far as equipment. It's, it's just hard to say that he ever, ever had better sounding drums than those Rodgers celebrities. That's, that's just all there is to it. Anyway, he hooked on with Rodgers in 1960, and he ended up staying with them until uh, 66, which was, you know, a, a six-year period, and he was very, very happy. Um, everybody knows this today. So much information is out there. The uh, Dynasonic snare drum, specifically the wood model, but he favored that one over the chrome over brass, was in fact designed for him. Uh, the interesting question is, did he like it? Yeah. Um, not so much. <laughs> he played it, but he wasn't super, super uh, knocked out with it. And I guess you could say from this point on starts the hunt for the, in air quotes, snare drum for him. Yeah. The one that's just going to knock him out. Um, and I'll just throw this in here now. A lot of guys don't know this. While he was with Rogers, this is 1965. He's playing the uh, BR Celebrities. He's got the Dynasonic, or does he? <laughs> he hooked up with Bob Grasso, who didn't even have the Fibes Drum Company yet. Wasn't even named that. It was called G and M Custom Drums, and that stand for Grasso and Morena. That was mm -hmm. his chemist. They had come out with fiberglass. Everybody knows that now. Buddy heard it. He was friendly with uh, Bob Grasso. Had to have that fiberglass snare. Had to have it. Well, there was no real company then. So Bob Grasso gave Buddy Rich his personal snare drum. Now, this is 1965. He's with Rogers. He loves Joe Thompson. Buddy did. He loved yep. the two top guys at Rogers. Buddy was so fond of. Ben Strauss and Joe Thompson, but still, <laughs> I guess you could say he put a scab drum up on that, uh, on that stage. What they did was they took that, uh, G and M custom wrapped it in Chrome, put on Rogers lugs, Rogers throw Rogers, butt. so from a distance, it looked like a dinosonic, but he played that drum loved the thing absolutely loved it until he was caught playing that fiberglass snare drum they were not happy and this is amazing buddy for one of the like few times in his life i guess um did the right thing he said all right i'll i'll, I'll take the snare drum off and and i'll play rogers and he ended up doing that for at least another year until around 66 and everybody knows that story cbs came in they bought Rogers. Mm -hmm. uh, disagreement with Buddy. They didn't want to back him. They didn't want to give him any money, blah, 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 blah. But he said, middle finger, I'm out of here. So he leaves Rogers. This is where it really gets interesting. And we can all blame Buddy for this, I think. Or maybe we should blame the next drum company. In 1967, this was a tumultuous year for Buddy as far as drums and snare drums. In 1967, he has no deal. Trixon Vox out of Germany picks up on it and offers Buddy a deal to play Trixon, for God's sakes. Buddy flies to Germany. This is all documented. Does sure. the deal. Well, this, this, this was not such a good thing. Uh, I don't know why they did it. Maybe it was to get Buddy into the fold. Trixon actually put up a monetary stipend. Huh. To that point... No drum company was paying any endorser to play their products. It would just be free gear and things like that. Exactly. And, and yeah. support while you're out on the road. You, sure, you need a symbol. Sure. You needed hardware. They were there for you. No money. That all changed in 1967. Buddy hooks on with tricks on. He's happy as a clam. Or is he? <laughs> Here we go again. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't last very long. It lasted a mere six months. Uh, now, little sidebar. Uh, there are recordings where you can hear his tricks on Vox kit. 
Uh, I thought the dry, and actually there's live recordings too. Uh, there was a TV show he did in the summer of 67. Uh, it was a replacement show for Jackie Gleason. So Jackie could go on vacation. Everybody knows it today. It was called Away We Go. If you ever pull up any of those videos on YouTube, and there are many, actually I recommend you do because it's great to see his big band featured like this. The drums you are looking at are not Rogers. They're tricks on Vox. Wow. Yeah, and they sound amazingly good. But there's reasons for that, too. Uh, and like I said, we could sidebar for hours. Yeah, yeah, but that's like a bizarre, um, I think when everyone kind of first hears about it, that, you know, I mean, Trixon is such a cool company, which hopefully in the near future, there'll be an episode on them. But they, um, it's just, you, you, you kind of go, wait, Buddy played that? that? That happens with Buddy sometimes, where it's like, there's a video of Buddy playing Peisty or there's video of Buddy playing a DW set or something. Absolutely. Like You're right. There's these moments of like, wow, he played that. But Trixon, I mean, that's a big part of his 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 history. So he so six months, though, he just he just wasn't they, you, like you said, they sounded great, but he just wasn't feeling it. I mean, that's that's also interesting about they paid him. I don't think they expected him to be playing him for six months and then stop. I, they, I'm sure they did not. Uh, who knows how he got out of that contract? Uh, yeah. But yes, they paid him. By the way, from a distance, when I was younger and I saw Buddy on Tricks On on like an old film, which I had seen, and then they, they came out on video, video, remember that? Mm -hmm. You would think he was playing Rogers because the lugs from a distance kind of look like Rogers' beaver tails. So yeah. a lot of people didn't know he was playing tricks on Vox until he finally got that front head on. Uh, and it didn't say tricks on, by the way, because in the U.S., tricks on was marketed under the name of Vox. Yes. So this all came to a head in 1967 at the Newport Jazz Festival, if I'm not mistaken. Buddy's band was featured. There was the tricks on set and as plain as day, Vox on that front head. Hmm. About the best publicity you could ever ask for as a drum company to have Buddy playing your drums, With, you know, without a doubt. And and boy, did you just say that right? You are correct. He sold drums like nobody's business. I think the only one that ever bested him on selling drum sets would be Ringo Starr. Sure, absolutely. Right. Otherwise, Buddy is uh, right up top. Okay, so the reason he um, he dumped the tricks on from my research. The drums just weren't holding up for him. Uh, I, I'm not knocking tricks on. Uh, I do have the tricks on snare drum in that collection. So I saw firsthand how they were built. And I, I, I can see why he didn't stay with them. There's just no way those were going to hold up without some serious, serious modification. Yeah. And with it's not, you know, Joe Schmo drummer playing at home. This is they're getting absolutely beaten to death by by buddy on a nightly basis uh true and you know he wasn't a basher by by any means but he was a strong player so yeah this stuff really had to uh, hold up to that night after night after night of interest side note with the tricks on company there were two snare drums that he played the standard one was the um one four forty luxus that was their wood model in white marine pearl he played that one the most, but he really liked a snare drum that they developed for him. And Trixon called it the uh, Buddy Rich Metal Concert. Hmm. Amazingly, uh, it was not brass. It was a steel shell. You know, steel shell snare drums get a bad rap. They shouldn't. Uh, you know, brass isn't the be-all, end-all. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, yeah. Steel snare drums can sound incredible set up correctly and, you know. God, everybody yeah. knows the rest of that, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and and I, I do want to note, too, that with, with the Trixon, if you look at the pictures of it, you think of Trixon or Vox, and you think of the kind of uh, conical drums, or you think of, like, the the sort of the teardrop, kind of like the melting. That's the, right, yeah. Buddy's drums were, were normal, uh, just round drums that looked like his, you know, one up, two down um, setup that is, for his yeah. his drum set. And that is correct. Uh Tricks on Vox, uh, you, you were uh, talking about the Tell Stars. Yes, exactly. Uh, buddy, no way was he going to play those. <laughs> I was going to say, be like, what Can the you hell imagine? Is this? I know. Um, <laughs> Tricks on had their Luxus line, that, and that was their standard shaped drum. 
And you're absolutely right. Uh, By the way, in in the uh, Trixon catalog for 1967, there is the Buddy Rich setup. Uh, featured exactly what you said one up two down the the two crash stands uh, you know shell mounted ride and uh, up to that point they didn't have a set like that so I mean that was uh, really really cool anyway we're still in 1967 six months later Trixon is out for whatever reason through his connection and mutual respect with Bob Grosso Buddy never officially endorsed Fives. There was no money. There was no deal. From what I've been able to research over the years, and I don't know this for a fact, this is just what I think from what I've researched. I believe Bob Grosso gave Buddy that full set of Mm -hmm. Fives chrome over fiberglass. I, I could find nothing anywhere about any money ever changing hands. Yeah, that's good to know, though. I mean, it's... Uh, I think if Buddy likes your drums and seems like he had a good relationship with the Fives guys, it's just uh, that's a part of him is that Fives snare drum and, and that relationship. And and you were absolutely right. Uh, hopefully people have been listening to my drivel. Uh, back in 65 is where Buddy's, uh, Buddy hooked on with Bob Grasso with that first fiberglass snare drum. So two years later, uh, he's playing a full set of fives. A- and that just took everybody completely by surprise. We already knew uh, he loved the snare drum. Or he must have if, if he was going to you know, play one while he was uh, endorsing uh, Rogers. But he dragged out the fives. He did an album with those two. You can find those on recordings. I have this all written down in my uh, documentation. Uh, I should have brought that to this interview. But like I said, there's just so much we could talk about. What what I'm saying is you can actually hear those fives on recordings. I have them all separated where he used those drums. You know, anyway, that being said, um, the interesting things when he when he when he played fives, the actual name of the drum company was never shown on that front head Mm. ever, ever. Kind of a missed opportunity there on on five. I know. I wonder. and, And 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 honestly, too. It is bizarre, I think, a little bit, because I'm so used to seeing Buddy playing White Marine Pearl. To see him playing those Chrome Fives, it's a little, uh, it's a little, you know, different to see that, you know. Yes, uh, it, it absolutely is. And you know, in '67 when he was playing Fives, I was only 12. I didn't have a clue he was playing Fives. I, I had no idea. I wonder what people thought back yeah. then, all the drummers. Because you're absolutely right. Here's this entire Chrome. Uh, set of drums, yeah, uh, which is crazy. Uh, a couple of things I can add about that. Um, he got that set from uh, Bob Grasso. There's no doubt about that. I read an interview with Buddy. I, I have this. I have so much material um, in in as as my wife calls it, Tommy Land, uh, <laughs> Tommy Shrine to Buddy Rich. <laughs> That's what she says. Yet yet she stays with me. I I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. He talked about the five set, and I, I've written this before um, in articles and, and other things. He did not like the actual drums. His quote, and, and I have this, I, I got to find this because uh, people have asked me about this before. He said he thought the bass drum and the toms sounded thin and lifeless. Hmm. Okay. Was not a, yeah, right? on the But absolutely positively loved that snare drum Hmm. which is going to come into big play with his next endorsement so here we go again 67 say about late june july give or take he was with the fives and he stayed with them right up until december of 67 so just about a six-month period that's when Um, who was the president then? Uh, It was um, Don Osborne Sr. was the president of Slingerland. Slingerland came calling because they must have recognized Buddy did not have an endorsement deal. And uh, they hooked up. And of course, I think this is the period that everybody seems to really, really remember Buddy Rich playing Slingerland. Yeah. Yeah. He was with them from um, 68 to 78 a solid 10 year period 
with mm. Slingerland. And if you think about that, in my opinion, only my opinion, that period, though, that was the height of his powers as a player. If you if you watch him, listen to him from sixty seven uh, through sixty eight, seventy into the early seventies, nobody could touch him. Nobody, uh, just un godly yeah and i think you got to remember too that buddy was born in 1917 so in 1968 if i quickly kind of did the phone math correct here i mean he's 51 ish years old he's not this like spring chicken who's uh you know super young but that being said he's buddy he's kind of super superhuman but i mean we're talking about his one of his many primes uh he's 50 you know, and he's yeah. just shredding. So that's just, you got to have that in the back of your mind that when you're watching these buddy videos in, in you know, late 60s, early 70s, the guy is, you know, for when most people in their lives are kind of like been working and they're slowing down a little bit, but he's pushing harder than ever. Yeah, uh, without a doubt. Um, I guess the cool thing snare drum wise is uh, this was pretty active for him with Slingerland uh and I, I they they were up to the uh the challenge yeah he started with the artist model with Slingerland and uh within that first year they renamed it to the uh to be the Buddy Rich artist hmm. of course um yeah. and that was either an 8 or 10 lug he he played primarily the 8 lug your standard 5 and a half by 14 with zoomatic um throw uh, nothing super fancy and god he made that that drum just jump yeah i mean he truly truly did that was 1968 when he started and i've got some actually excellent photographs in my collection uh, a couple never before seen uh, i i really should let some of this stuff out for other people to see but i mean uh, it's in tommy land though it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to get into Tommy land. <laughs> it's hard to get out of Tommy land. Um, yeah. That being said, two years later, this drum, while he was with Slingerland, uh, took the drum community by storm. Everybody wanted this drum. Uh, Bart, I, 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 I know you're, you're going to know exactly what it is. Uh, he wanted something different. Uh, word is that Buddy had some input on the design of this particular model. Uh, this actually came out in 1969, but it wasn't cataloged until 1970 for the public. He was playing it a year prior. Anyway, it's the Slingerland 4x14. Mm, yeah. Buddy Rich. And you know this drum because it has the 16 lugs opposed that go up and down. Eight top, eight bottom, and they're side by side. Everybody knows this drum. Uh, Slingerland actually offered that drum uh, in, in, in two different ways. Uh, in your choice of pearl, in Buddy's case, it was white marine pearl, and chrome over wood. Hmm. The COW, amazingly, is the one, well, it's not amazing, actually, there's a reason, is the one that Buddy preferred. I figured that out on my own because I had both those drums. And by the way, in the collection, both those model snares in my collection are 69s. Oh, nice. So you got the real, uh, your, real your period deal. correct. Yeah. Yes. Very, very difficult to find. Uh, and it even gets crazier. The serial numbers, which a lot of people and historians say doesn't mean all that much. They were just pulling badges out of a bin and putting them on a drum. But that being said, uh, without having going and looking at the badges, I used to know this. Um, I think those numbers are only 600 apart. Wow. On both those drums. Wow. Anyway, you know what I did, Bart? I set them up um, side by side with the exact same heads, exact same tuning. And by the way, these really need to have the single flange stick choppers, mm -hmm. which is how Buddy had them on his drums. He loves stick choppers. Um, I have those on these snares. And I compared them. In AB, there is a difference. That white marine pearl wrap being just thicker plastic actually locks that drum up just a taste hmm. the chrome over wood super crystalline bright 
And anyway, that's the one he played uh, more than the uh, White Marine Pearl. Mm, that's fascinating. And I just want to ask with the Slingerland stuff, what what are your thoughts? You know, I'm sure this is another whole conversation, though. But like, um, you know, obviously Slingerland was, you know, they Gene Krupa and Slingerland were just like, you know, since the beginning, they were together and he was kind of their catalog cover guy um, until, I guess, the late 60s. What um, what were what were Buddy's thoughts about that, about coming in? on Gene Krupa's kind of like, you know, hallowed ground and being the new, obviously he's, he's a huge famous guy and Gene is such a gentleman that I'm sure it was fine. But um, yeah, what's the story with that? A wow. Bit? I'm just smiling here, which you can't see because that, that is an excellent question um, to buddy's credit, depending on how you want to look at it. That's why he wouldn't go with Slingerland. Um, there are two reasons for that. Buddy loved Gene. Everybody knows it. He respected Gene. Everybody knows it. But there was also Buddy being Buddy. He wanted to be the top guy, the guy. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened in the late 60s. Uh, Gene passed away, if memory serves, in 1973, mm -hmm. I believe. Yep. So he was still with Slingerland, but he was on his way down. He was older. He had health issues. Buddy was the guy, and Slingerland obviously built that up pretty largely and, and made him the top cat. Although in some of those earlier catalogs, 68, 69, uh, Gene was still in there, if, I, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but that's why. And, and that's such a good question. I, I think maybe that's why he did not go with Slingerland before he did. Yeah, for such a long time. I mean, yeah, that's because I guess he was just, I guess, out of, you know, you want to think it was out of respect, but it was also probably out of like, well, I'm not going to be the number one, you know, the big dog there. So I'm, you know, I, exactly. I need to be, I need to be on top. And it's so sad that Gene died when he was 64, you know, when, you, know. when you look at that, because um, we're talking Buddy again is in his prime in his 50s and 60s. Eh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. Very sad. And extremely so. And like I said, I, I hope people don't think bad, badly of me for saying this, but I, I agree with you. 50% um, of it, if not more, is Buddy wanted to be top guy. Yeah. You know, he had the ego. And let's face it, you have to have ego. You you have to. Sure. You, you can't be a shrinking violet and, and, and be at the top of your game. It just doesn't work. No. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Anyway, that being said... That's around 1970. He played that snare drum for almost a solid three years. This is the four by 14. Uh, that indicates that he was pretty happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> 1973, maybe late 72. Hard to really, really dial in. The Rich in London album comes out from Ronnie Scott's Only Buddy, Only Buddy could pull this off and get away with it. Everybody knows the story. On uh, the album cover in full color, side shot of Buddy from the left side, hi-hat, rack tom, snare drum. Is it a Slingerland? It is not. It's a Fives. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it, yeah. It, 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 I'm not like breaking any new ground no, here. No. Everybody knows that. Uh, but back then, I'm sure that took the drum world by uh, surprise. I'll tell you who it did take by surprise. Don Osborne Sr. Uh, yeah. He was, oh. I mean, it has to be like a, it's a, it's like, I mean, it's probably a little over dramatic, but it's like if your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever is kind of cheating on you and a picture of them together gets like posted on social media. <laughs> you know, it's, a fine analogy. Yeah. It's exactly what it is. And Don Osborne, I'm sure, felt that way. And by the way, to back up a little bit, Buddy's endorsement was compensated with Slingerland. They were paying him. Yeah. Uh, Tricks on opened that door. Yeah. So not only are they giving him equipment, they're paying him. And he trots out that five snare drum. Uh, many stories abound on this. As a matter of fact, uh, Mel Torme covered this very, very well in the uh, Traps the Drum Wonder, which is actually an excellent read. I, I would imagine everybody either owns that book by now or at least has read it. Um, and if they haven't, they should. Um, but the thumbnail sketch is Don Osborne got really, really upset, but 
not so upset that he wanted to part ways with Buddy. Yeah. He said, look, we'll make you a snare drum that will make you happy. I'm telling you, we'll build you one. I, I, again, I'm just paraphrasing. Sure, of course. So, 1974, Buddy's still with Slingerland. Out comes the brand new Slingerland 5x14 BR TDR, uh, which stands for Total Dynamic Response, says Slingerland. So here we go. Did Buddy like that snare drum? Absolutely loved it. It shows up on many videos around this period, 1973, 1974, still photos. There's the Slingerland 5 by 14 BR TDR. Hmm. Uh, still with stick chopper hoops. That's how Buddy played it. Uh, they sold more of them with the stick savers. Uh, I personally love the stick choppers myself, except you better have a drumstick endorsement. Uh, that's <laughs> yeah. all I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. Because, Bart, have you ever played stick choppers? No, I, I, no, I don't think I have, actually. Well, I'll tell you what. Look under your snare drum after, like, maybe 45 minutes of playing it. Sawdust. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Wow. It just shred. But they sound like nothing else. Buddy knew it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that didn't last very long. Huh. Late 74, maybe mid 74, back to the fives. Jeez, man, he just the connection he had with that drum. And, and you do kind of feel bad for, you know, Slingerland in that in that scenario. But but I guess, buddy, he he had the power in in those relationships where, you know, he, he did could get away with it. I guess they're, they're like, well, we want him to endorse us. So, you know, we wanted to say Slingerland on the bass drum, but we want him to be happy or at least you know uh i don't know if they cared if he was happy it's just play the damn yeah. play the damn drums but wow what a yeah. story yeah i i certainly want to don't want to take up too much time but i have a little sidebar here that actually factors in nicely to this um in 1973 that was my senior year of high school uh yes i am that old uh buddy rich and the band came into uh springfield massachusetts to play the uh paramount and uh, my buddy and I, he was also a drummer, uh, we got tickets and we went to, that was, that was I think, my, uh, my third time seeing Buddy. Mm. I was only 17. Anyway, there are the Slingerlands set up on the stage. Uh, the band's not on yet. And anyway, the band comes out, Buddy comes out. They play. And I'm only 17. This is God's honest truth on a stack of Bibles. That snare drum. I could not believe we had good seats. Uh, Buddy didn't mic up like drummers mic today. It was like maybe an overhead and a bass drum mic. That's it. Yeah, you could you you could hear the projection yeah. of that snare drum in that entire theater. Well, this snare drum just it, it, it just knocked me out. I, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, every stroke. Buddy played two sets like he always did. Finished the first set, few words, bang, they're gone. You know behind the curtain i'm sitting there with my buddy and you know when you're 17 forgive me but you got the uh you know uh, can i say this the ball's made out of titanium sure you just do i said i'm gonna go and look at his drums i i i need to see <laughs> i i need to see what that snare drum is and i did exactly that i walked up to that stage bart there's no security yeah there's no uh, you know event security i hopped up on the stage and went right behind his drums. You, you couldn't do that today. No. 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 You'd be in a headlock, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, on the ground. Um, and there it was. It was a chrome snare drum. I had never seen one of these in my life. And there's the badge. Fives. Oh, boy. Absolutely true story. I didn't know it then what I was seeing. But I knew it wasn't a Slingerland snare drum. Uh, by Jeez. the way, I, I won't get into this now, but that is the same night that I met Buddy uh, oh, really, wow. really quickly. Yeah, yeah, please. As long as I'm on the stage, I said to myself, uh, I'm just going to go backstage. I'm going to go meet him. He's my <laughs> idol. No, I swear to wow. you. Wow. I'm just going to help myself to Buddy's food. I'm going <laughs> to. No, that's fine. You, you did have uh, you did have some. some well, you're seven. You're 17. You're invincible. You yeah. don't care. I was so into drums, so into Buddy. He was my man, my hero since 1967. Buddy was the guy. I set up my drums like him. We we all did this. Anyway, I did meet him that night. Uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, I, I will just say 
It didn't start so well, but he softened. He took pity on me, and it actually ended up being really, really nice. It did not start well, though, and that was all on me. It's because of what I did. Jeez. I'm just going to let that hang there. Yeah, right maybe now. maybe that'll be our uh, bonus episode that we talk about oh, for the, the, the Patreon oh my God. thing. But anyway, okay, wow, that, you're that's, a, yeah, you're a buddy. You're a buddy fanatic since day one. You know, <laughs> day I was 12. I have to tell you this. Here's what started it. 12 years old. I was taking drums for my second year. Uh, I was in uh, sixth grade, I think seventh grade. My father, I, I loved my dad, brought home Buddy Rich swinging new big band live at the Shea. Hmm. Full color Buddy sitting behind his white Marine Pearl Rogers. And band was on fire. Uh, he, those were all the right players. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Anyway, that's what started this whole thing. Hmm. So just to let you know, from 1967, uh, he was my guy. Wow. Which 67 you know? was obviously the very interesting year of, of Trixon. And that's, that's, that's an, that's a, that's a unique buddy year right there. Um, it, it is indeed. Of course, you know, back then I didn't know no, any of, of course. that. Yeah. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by dream symbols and their awesome new symbol bag. It is a heavy-duty, strong, durable cymbal bag made for professionals with a nice tread on the bottom, and it's reinforced everywhere that it needs to be. Uh, you have three compartments on it, two in the main pocket area and then one separate compartment on the outside of the bag. It has padded shoulder straps and a nice handle, or you can wear it with a single strap kind of across your body. It fits sizes up to a 24-inch ride, which is really huge, um, and then... You can just walk around having the confidence that your symbols are safe in this awesome bag from Dream Symbols. Check it out at dreamsymbols.com or on social media at Dream Symbols. So we're at 68 to 78, buddies with Slingerland, right? Yes. Which, that, that was an iconic phase too. I do think of also, there's some some cool videos on Johnny Carson with him. And I remember he took the Slingerland sticker uh, and kind of put it on his forehead and was like, I play Slingerland drums. And uh, that was good. Bart, do you remember? Um, oh, God, I have every one of those performances on DVD. I mean, I everyone, I am nuts. <laughs> that was the night that Johnny replaced the first 16 by 16 floor tom head with parchment paper. Yes. That was that one. Yeah, and th yeah exactly. Hysterical. And then you think like, boy, and, you know, not too many people could get away with that. Ah, <laughs> oh, Johnny could. Uh, yes. Uh, Kathy Rich um, has said it many, many times. Uh, buddy loved Johnny. Yep. And, and, and vice versa, uh, of course. But no, you're absolutely right. Anyway, he ended Slingerland. Um, this is the last thing I'll say about it. Playing the five snare drum. I can't lie to you. And by then, that relationship had completely eroded. Don Osborne had had enough. Buddy had had enough. Bye bye. Yeah. So, yeah. Buddy splits, goes back to Ludwig in 1978. And what's interesting about that, this was his third time with Ludwig. Yep. This would be his third endorsement. Wow. Back and forth. That's. What's that call got to be like, you know, like, hey, this is or his management or whatever, like, you know, we're, we're shopping it, like him shopping around for endorsements. And then it's like, um, well, I'm I'm back. It's just I'm back. It's, it's, you know, if I'm if yeah. I'm not mistaken, um, you're, you're half right on that. I think they came to him. OK, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, uh, now the. The old man, Ludwig Sr., had since passed, and uh, Bill Ludwig uh, Jr. was in control of the company, and he saw an opportunity. Uh, Buddy Rich was still huge. Well, he was huge till the day he died. Sure. Huge in the drum world. So um, uh, despite his inner voices telling him, maybe I shouldn't do this, he yeah. invited Buddy back into the fold. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it was not smooth sailing. Let's mm. just say that. Yeah, it was rough. By then, Buddy was uh, getting getting money, and he was incredibly, incredibly demanding with what he wanted. And I'll, I'll step a little outside the box and say that um, I don't know that Buddy had a whole lot of respect for Bill Ludwig Jr. And he used to put him through the ringer. Buddy did, mm. uh, maybe just because he could. I don't know. Yeah, Ludwig ended up making 
so many full drum sets for Buddy during this period uh, because Buddy was giving them away like you would give someone a stick of gum. Wow. Well, I think of him giving Buddy giving uh, Johnny the L- a Ludwig drum set um, for his house. If I'm not mistaken, I know there's some like an interview or something about that with Johnny Carson getting a drum set. Yes. Um, but God, so he was just giving these. I mean, that has to be tough for Ludwig to be like, oh. you need another one. <laughs> you know, um, Bill Ludwig Jr., wrote a book. Uh, I have it. Uh, I, I think many drummers that are into uh, the, the history of all these great American drum companies would have the, um, uh, the history of the Ludwig drum company. He discusses that. And uh, again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I don't have the book in front of me, but yeah. it got to the point where Ludwig drum company had ready to go brand new in the cases, two drum sets at any given time, because they knew buddy was going to call and say, I need a set. Jeez. I need a set. Um, yeah, it got old quick. Yeah. Well, anyway, while he was with them from 78 to 79, he played the Superphonic 400. He started with that, but quickly abandoned it and went to the Super Sensitive, mm-hmm. which makes sense. Uh, the one he started with was the uh, Chrome Over Brass 5x14 in 79, but in and around... Uh, 81 or so, I, I can't be exactly quoted, maybe may a little sooner on that, but he switched to the Ludwig 5x14 hammered bronze, super sensitive. Hmm. And that was a snare drum he stayed with until he left Ludwig. Wow, yeah. uh, there were reasons for that. Um, again, I have all these drums uh, in the collection. The hammered bronze was a very hard one to find because... Uh, fitting within my parameters of I wanted to get the drum built at the same time Buddy played it. This one was one of the hardest to find. I can't lie to you. Um, I did find it. Um, I know what he liked about it now. Yeah, I, I can honestly, yeah. Bronze is like the best of maybe two worlds, possibly three. Uh, the hammer takes a little bit of that high end off the bronze and it softens the note so it sounds almost like a wood drum but because it's bronze it has the cut and the clarity of brass except that it's bronze it's a little softer simply put rim shots uh dead center brushes they speak like nothing else on a hammered bronze snare drum that was an absolute beauty Hmm. yeah that's interesting and that's it for Buddy's type of playing with those, I mean, he he is a snare drum guy. You said it earlier on where it's like, you know, the snare drum is his voice. Exactly. That's totally right. That kind of sums up why, it, just this ep- episode in general, why it's such a big deal to have Buddy playing your snare drum uh-huh. is because it's, that's his most important, you know, toms are one thing, which we all know Buddy sounds great on every drum he touches, yeah. but um, he needs something that's that uh, articulate. Exactly right. And and look at all of his solos, all of them, uh, unless he's playing, you know, a cymbal solo, but eventually he makes his way to the snare drum and it all emanates from there. Yeah. Yeah. That drum was so, so important. And going back to how we even started talking about this in the beginning, there you have it. I mean, from 1950 till he left Ludwig in 82, 15 different snare drums. Oh, And I want to add, uh, people have called me out on this over the years, uh, and I have an answer for it. No, I saw Buddy playing a power tone. I saw him one night um, playing a Ludwig Pioneer. Hmm. Um, I just pulled that one out of my my butt. But (laughs) yeah, the point is, I don't know whether he really did. Sure, sure. Oh, I I saw him playing a... um, a Gene Krupa, Chrome Over Brass. You probably did. My collection specifically the drums he played nightly, night after night, week after week after week after week. Uh, Not a single drum here, a single drum there. Remember at the beginning you mentioned Peisty? I think think we talked about that. Yeah, we did. Uh, He he never endorsed Peisty, but yes, he he played a Peisty ride uh, on a few different gigs. It's like that, but that doesn't mean that that was – what he was after and what, what he really 
no. wanted to play. That just wasn't his ideal. But is he a drum- um, he's a drummer, and if someone's giving you, you know, hey, I have this snare. Like, so, so what you're basically saying is, yes, these 15 drums were his kind of like, these were ones he's using over and over, and here and there, there might be some 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 other drums thrown in for him uh, yes. to be experienced. So if people saw him playing a whatever, then that's because he was using it for that one particular night. But these are his, you know... His- I, you know you know, what's, you know what's a good word? I, for me, anyway. These are his stalwart snare drums. Sure. Yeah, the nightly drums that he, uh, he depended on. Yeah. You know, if you tie all this up um, in a nice little package... This is what I've always gotten out of it from doing all this research over the years. For me, the five snare drum was the, in capitals, T-H-E, the one. Yeah. People, they have different opinions, and, and, and I respect that. But he went back to that drum too many times. Too many. Um, and it's also been asked of me then, why did we never see the five snare drum again after he left Slingerland? And that's true. You never did. Not once. Hmm. After well, 78, you didn't see it again. You never saw it again. That's it. Never saw it again uh, live with, with Buddy playing. Uh, my thought on that is look at the snare drums he gravitated towards from 78 to 82 with Ludwig. They were all metal shells. Yeah. No wood. None. Zero. No wood, all metal. So we have to assume the chrome over brass and the hammered bronze, especially super sensitive was doing it for him. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, lucky for Ludwig. Cause it's kind of like, Oh, okay, good. He likes our drum. He's not going to go like cheating on us with another, another brand. But I, I want to ask then like, am I mistaken or did he only actually endorse fives for, Half of for six months in 1967, like yeah. is that what you well, said? Yeah. Uh, he never officially endorsed, oh, fives. sure, but he played fives, he Brief played player. them. There was no ads, that's right. Fives never put him in the catalog, hmm. nothing, nothing. Um, that's always bothered me, but the people that could answer the why to that are gone, yeah. You know, missed opportunity. If, but there had to be a reason. I mean, but you know, you think you'd be slapping Buddy on the cover of your catalogs and stuff. Well, you would if that were the case. But if like you I were said, an endorse, endorser, yeah. yeah. What I honestly believe is, after he left uh, Tricks on Vox, uh, nobody was coming forth forth with an endorsement. He had to play something. He had those fives, so he brought them out. Yeah, that's what I, we again. You know, uh, we already know he loved the five snare drums, but uh, he played the rest of the set for six months until Slingerland came along. And, you know, uh, that was that. Hey, you know, one thing I I forgot to add, this is kind of interesting on the Ludwig final endorsement. He hooked up with them in 78. He stayed with them for a mere two years. How can that be? Hmm. Because he played Ludwig until 82 yes but without an endorsement deal had a big falling out with bill ludwig uh jr and they parted ways in 1980 again buddy's got to play something what's he gonna play he kept playing the ludwigs uh all of 81 all of 82 up until 83 when he got the restored set of 1940s uh, Radio Kings uh, by Joe McSweeney of the Ames Drum Company that gave those to Buddy. So that's interesting. And one other thing I noticed, if you find photographs between, say, 81 and 82 with Buddy's big band, not all the time, but there's a lot, there's no Ludwig logo on that front head. Interesting. So that was kind of a little bit of a, uh, you know, I'm not endorsing you. I like your drums, but it it was like, I'm not going to represent you. No advertising. Uh, however, that doesn't stay 100% true. There are other photographs during that period where there is a logo. So who knows? Yeah. You busted a front head, whatever. Sure. But, uh, but the BR shield obviously is on every last one of these sets that we uh, just discussed. And, of course, you know, um, all the different snare drums. So. Yeah, yeah. All right. So as, as we're kind of getting close to the end here, I, I just a couple questions. So two questions come to mind. First, 
Am I mistaken here? I mean, I know we're kind of in a, a bit of, you know, his, we're talking about the, I don't want to say the middle of his career, uh, m- middle to so- close to the end. Was Slingerland one of, if not his longest running endorsements with that 10 year period there, 68 to 78, or did he have a longer stretch early on with, um, with, a, with Ludwig or, you know? Yeah, that is a great question it truly truly is and uh i actually looked at that uh, many many years ago there's two ways to answer it if if you want to call it staying with one company from start to finish that was the longest however he was with ludwig um i think the same if not longer but over the period of three different endorsements gotcha however if you want to go one more, this is this is so fun to do this. He was with Slingerland from 1932 to 1945. Okay. So if you add that endorsement to his 10-year endorsement from 68 to 78, Slingerland blows them all out of the water. Yeah, 20-plus years there. There you mean, go. Okay. Yep. Wow. So it just depends how you want to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Man, he... I don't know, man. He, 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 the, the, the jumping around is, um, is so <laughs> interesting, but, but like on a <laughs> nightly basis, he'd be up on the stage playing the drums and to, to most people, that's all that matters. But, um, I mean, he's, he's an in-demand guy to be endorsing drums. That's very clear, uh, with all this. Without a doubt. Hey, you know, this has, well, it has everything to do with buddy. I play, uh, professionally. It's how I made my living. Um, and I, and I still do, although at this stage of the game with COVID and everything else, uh, the gigs aren't as plentiful as they used to be, although I'm still working. Sure. That being said, I have two buddy rich model, uh, drum sets and, and these aren't hanger Queens, meaning I do play these yeah. and, and I, and I love them both. One is a set of 1965 Rogers, Buddy Rich Celebrities, and that's the sweet spot when he was with uh, Rogers, 1965. These are gorgeous. I gigged these for probably 12, 14 years solid. Mm. I also have, boy, for me, these are the ones. I have a set of um, late 1967 early 68 fives buddy rich chrome over fiberglass the full set wow bart there are only two of these that i have ever seen in my entire life one was buddies i have the other one so how was it all right explain that a little bit though so if he didn't fully endorse it how is it a buddy rich was it the same sizes and year and all that okay Here's what happened. A, a guy out on Long Island, which is where Fibes was based until they sold to C.F. Martin in 1970, which is a whole other story, um, was a big Buddy Rich fan. He ordered these specifically in those sizes, 14, 24, 9, 13, 16, 16, 16, 16, and the 5 by 14, 10 lug, 5 snare drum. And uh, Bob Grasso built these by hand for this gentleman um how i got them is just crazy how it all happened and i I won't bore you with it now but i am thrilled to have them i've had them now for i think five years wow Uh, i restored them it took me three months uh had to replace a lot of fasteners that had rusted fiberglass i don't know if anybody knows this it continues to gas out almost for life and it's very corrosive. Hmm. So all the fasteners inside had rusted. But anyway, make a long story short. Um, so I've been playing the Fives Buddy Riches for, oh, the past, I think, four years. Solid. That's awesome. And you, yeah. you're a fan? You think they sound great? Oh, boy. See, this could go on and on and on. <laughs> uh, Buddy, Buddy was right about a lot of things. He was very opinionated. We all know this. He was also wrong about a lot of things. Um, yeah. He was wrong about that. Of course, back when he was playing them in 67, head choice is not what we have today. True. Today, just by changing heads, plies, makeup, muffling, you can make any drum sound almost like anything you want it to sound like. Yeah, very true. So fives today, thin and lifeless? I think not. Yeah. Yeah. And he clearly didn't give enough 
I mean, he, that was a pretty short period there, so maybe he didn't have enough time. And he was, he's boom. He's, he's on to the next one. Yeah, right there. on to the next one. Didn't really care. Yeah. Hey, by the way, if anybody wants to see and hear him play those fives, he did a series of uh, Mike Douglas TV shows in 67. They're easy to find on YouTube. Yep. Those are the fives, plain as day. And I'll tell you right now, they sound great. Hmm. They sound freaking great great so i don't know what he was talking about but yeah anyway yeah that's 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 good to know and and i'm sure i've uh i'll post those um on social media so people can see that that video um and i'm sure i probably have in the past but i'll do it again and all right so you you obviously kind of created um sort of as close to period correct drums as you could with these 15 snare drums i'm talking the real deal buddy rich the ones he played where are are some of them are they are they still out there of course one of those drums could be you know worth wow. a lot of money but where, where where are those floating around they are out there uh furthermore three of those were offered to me these are actual owned played by buddy rich uh when i was putting this collection together and by the way it took me just about 20 years to assemble these snare drums uh, I, I think that's important to say. This yeah. didn't happen overnight. No. Um, but anyway, they're out there. And now I think every last one of those are in private collections. Now, why don't I have any of them? To be totally honest with you, price. Of course. Um, one of the most coveted snare drums for Buddy would have to be the Rogers White Marine Pearl Dynasonic. And if you happen to get a 65 or a 66... That's the one you want. And one of those came down the pike. This was owned by Buddy. Positively, absolutely proven provenance, everything. This was one of Buddy's snare. By the way, he didn't have one snare drum from any company. He had numerous snare drums, but they were all the same model. Anyway, there's just no way. I almost did it, too. The asking price part, at the time, 20 grand. <laughs> Oh yeah, God. see, I heard you laugh. Wow. Well, you, I got I to tell you this. I said to my wife, I said, "Hun, I have a chance to buy one of Buddy's actual drums. Uh, it, it would be great for the collection, but I, uh, I, I don't know. I, she says, what are they asking? I said, uh, 20 grand. She goes, you know what? Buy it. Oh, wow. This is why we've been married for 34 years. She's just a sweetheart. But no, um, sanity got the better of me yeah that's i mean twenty thousand dollars that's that's i think you'd walk every time you walk by it you kind of catch you know out of the side of your eyes thinking this is awesome you're thinking twenty thousand dollars yeah that's like, awesome you're out of your mind yeah because you know what bart would i gig that drum probably not it was buddies yeah and after you've bought it and you have it and it was his now what do you do yeah so anyway, I didn't, but uh, that was one of three. I was offered one of his fives snares, and this one I came the closest on. This gentleman had a 1974. He was on Buddy's band. Slingerland 5x14 BRTDR. We just couldn't agree on a price. I knew what it was worth to me, and I offered that. And he thought he could do better, and he did do better. Yeah. And by the way, I did not lowball him. I am not one of those guys. I am not a bottom feeder. Sure. But it's just like what you said, Bart. You want to spend how much money, and 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 then what happens after after the fact? What do you what do you have? Yeah. Anyway, so there's your answer. They're out there, and I I know uh, one, two, three. I know three guys collectors that have these drums. Yeah. I mean, you you certain people have have have. Uh, a lot of money from their professional life and um, can just have these things and collect them. And I think that's awesome and more power to them. And, uh, but I think you've done, there's no, I mean the, the cost, which we, I don't even think is, is could be added up of if you added up all of the snare drums that you have, if they were the actual played buddy, rich snare drum oh, would geez. be astronomical and in literally impossible unless you're, you know, a 
very, exactly. very, very wealthy person. So no, exactly right. Hey, you know, in addendum, um, when that drum came along, th- this is important. This is way back when I want to say probably close to 15 years ago when just a regular white Marine Pearl Rogers Dynasonic was going for four to five grand. Jeez. Uh, now they're not because, eh, you know, that whole market is, I, I hesitate to say crash, but it's come down quite a bit. So that's why that drum was up today. I don't think you could even ask that for one of Buddy's drums. And may I add, he's been gone, unfortunately, for 34 years. As each year goes by, fewer and fewer people are into him like we all are. Yeah. And and that also hurts value, in my opinion. Yeah, it's different. I mean, that's a great point. I mean, it's uh, it's you'd you'd be amazed sometimes, and I I see this from being on social media with post and drum videos that people, the younger, younger, younger generation. I'm talking fifteen year olds. You can't really blame them, but it's just different. It's not. It is. I mean, it's just a different world, and um, they're into more uh, modern drummers and uh but they'll 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 come to their senses and well, hopefully uh, <laughs> i mean right we are still carrying the flame for all these greats yeah which were today's players wouldn't even have what they have if it weren't for these guys but again that, that that's a whole other subject but yeah you know it is anyway so um this has just been so awesome because it's been a long well, time so. a long time in the works and and like i said <laughs> I, I mean i remember I've I've moved twice since oh, we, we originally talked, actually, because we moved for a little bit and then a kid and we had to move again because it to a bigger house. But I remember sitting in my basement watching your video with Jim Messina, uh, whose whose YouTube handle is Gumph, G-U-M-P-H. I know, isn't that crazy? I one, know. two, three, four. And I'm watching it and I'm seeing it. And I'm going, oh, man, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to uh, Joe Meckler, Joey Boom and, oh, and a couple yes. other people. And finally... We've made it happen, but I'm going to share that in the description, this great video um, of Tommy's, uh, yeah. the video, so you can actually see these and, and hear, hear, you know, some oh, of the same. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, um, I just want to add one last thing. I should have said this. Yeah. This is very, very important to whoever might listen to our conversation. Um, everything I gave as far as dates, information, um, this is what I researched at the time, uh, coupled together with some of my opinions, which I formed based on what I researched. What I'm simply saying is um, there could be dissenting opinions. Uh, guys could say, oh, no, nah, you're all wrong. He didn't play tricks on a 1960. I just want to say this is what I was able to research. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's point. just important to me. Yeah. So. And, and I mean... I will throw it out there that Tommy's the real deal and does not just throw out things that are dates and times that he's not very, very sure of. So if there, of course there's other opinions, but that's just the way the world works. Yeah. And what that also means, Bart, is if someone comes up with a piece of info that I haven't been able to uncover, great. A- add it into the dialogue. I'm just saying this isn't the final word. This is just what I was able to research at, at the time. Yeah. It's so. a it's a normal uh, that's just how it works with this stuff. Um, so now what I think we'll do is Tommy and I can pop over. We'll wrap up this episode and uh, maybe do a couple minutes. We got to hear the story about uh, meeting Buddy and oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's OK. And uh, if if people want to hear that bonus episode and the other ones, go to drum mystery podcast dot com. And uh, there's a little link for Patreon. And it's just a lot of fun to hear these these extra little conversations. But for now, on this episode, um, Tommy, is there anywhere, you know, I mean, you, you, you play around and do all this stuff, but is there any links or anything you want to, where people can find you, or you want to share some articles, anything like that here at the end? Boy, thank you so much for asking that actually. Um, there is, and there, there can be, um, real quickly, I've been working with a Frank Sinatra show. This is my 14th year with them. This is a great, yeah, a great group. We just did a TV show, uh, this is crazy. Last Thursday, uh, that's being mixed and edited. Once that's done, uh, I believe that is going to be available for anybody on YouTube. And I would certainly supply that link to you because, you know, 
Yes, please. Then you can see, you can see my, my hideous mug. Uh, <laughs> you can see one of my five sets, although I'm using my smaller fives because this was in a TV studio. Yeah. And, and you can see what it is that I do. Uh, I will say this. I've been playing the Buddy Rich setup. Uh, since I was a kid, and I only altered it for a period of about six years in the 70s. But yeah, so everybody might get a kick out of that. And sure. everything I play for drums are vintage, blah, blah, blah. So I would supply you with that. I would let you know. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. I'll share that and everyone because it's just fun to see uh, what people are actually doing, you know, like out in the real world, uh, not just talking about uh, <laughs> drums, is, but but playing them. Um, so yeah. Cool. All right. Well, Tommy, um, so happy to have you on here and we will wrap up now and then do a little bonus episode. And uh, thanks again for everyone um, for listening. And, and if you check out the bonus, great. But uh, yeah, Tommy, thank you for being here. Uh, Bart, thank you very much. This was a pleasure. I just hope I didn't sound like an idiot. No. And I so. love, I, I, I do know that you also, and I'll say this now uh, publicly, you have a lot of knowledge. So I'd love to have you back on in the future. Um for some other topics. So maybe oh, in 2025, we'll get around to, uh, <laughs> yeah, if I'm not in the ground, yeah. <laughs> we'll have you back on. Cause it'll take another couple years to schedule, but, uh, no, I'm kidding. So I know we'll have Tommy back on, but, um, for now, thank you, Tommy. Very good. Thank you, Bart. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.